Today we're going to cover more stuff on apologetics, believe it or not. So in Genesis 11, there's quite a few uh, problems that we come across. And then I have an interesting thing for women, if we have time. All right. So I'm sure you women would get an enjoyment out of this one. <clears throat> All right, Genesis chapter 11. <clears throat> we left off with the generation. So verse 9, we finished off. Ugh, what a horrible noise. Okay. Verse 9, uh, we finished the story of the Tower of Babel. Now, I like how the Bible ends here, and it's very interesting to note how the Holy Spirit attention is diverting or changing, transitioning. The last part of verse 9, it shows the Lord scattered them abroad upon the face of all the earth. So the Lord scattered them out. He had all the nations divided. But then he starts to discuss, discuss at verse 10, all of a sudden, these are the generations of Shem. Now, why is it all of a sudden that he would uh, transition his attention from all the children that came from the Tower of Babel all of a sudden to Shem? Why would he divert his attention over there? Because of a very important character, Abram, when we look at verse 27. So all the way from uh, 10 through 27, we hit the generations of Abram. Now, if we go from back to forward, this whole context is about the generations that Abram came from. Now, the reason why God suddenly diverted his attention to Abram, uh, rather than all the other different nations, right? Genesis 10, God concentrated on all different nations. But all of a sudden at Genesis 11, he concentrated on one nation. Why is that? The reason why is because God doesn't take important the nations anymore at Genesis 10. Because Genesis 11 showed you why. They messed up with the Tower of Babel. So because of that, God knows that mankind, they have an inclination to apostasy. And if you know the story of Semiramis and Nimrod, after they did their uh, Tower of Babel incident, so obviously in the map, it wasn't... Uh, really located here, but uh, I'm just drawing this. That way people can understand better. So the Tower of Babel incident, it fell through, but Nimrod wasn't done. If you uh, read Hislop's book about two Babylons, then he'll point out how Nimrod was able to still have a worldwide effect. Why? Because of his religion. If you can't get it through civilization, you can always win through re uh, religion. Think about Rome. They can't win with their civilization, but they won with their religion. That's why their power continues today, Roman Catholicism. So Nimrod, how his system carried on was not through his civilization. It fell through. The Lord tore it all apart, but through his religion. And it's scattered through all nationalities around the world. And it is very scary when you look at all these countries around the world, you go to South America, you go to Asia, and then you go to Europe, uh, you go to Rome and Greece and India and China, you'll see these gods or goddesses where they match up with Nimrod or goddesses that has a baby in her arms, kind of like Mary uh, with the baby Jesus, supposedly, but that's not what it meant. What it meant was during ancient times, this is before you had the statues of Mary with the baby Jesus. We're talking about like probably a thousand years ago, if not longer. That there were uh, before the 80s, before the Roman Catholicism. So a thousand years prior to that, that, perhaps, that they had these statues, women's statues holding a baby in her arms. So if, not, if that didn't come from Mary and Jesus, then who? Who? So you have to get it from somebody or something. Obviously, Nimrod and Semiramis. So Semiramis, uh, when she gave birth to a child after Nimrod died, according to some sources, not sure if it's true or not, but Shem supposedly killed Nimrod out of anger because of Nimrod's great sin and where you get these baby sacrifices is all originated from Nimrod, where you get the holidays, Christmas and Easter even, which, had some, which undoubtedly has pagan 
a roots and upbringings that comes from Nimrod, that comes from Semiramis. <clears throat> so all of this paganism stuff, it originated with uh, Semiramis and then with her baby that gave forth Tammuz after Nimrod died. So when Nimrod was murdered by Shem, Semiramis gave birth to another child named Tammuz and then she claimed it was the reincarnation of Nimrod. Obviously, that was a bunch of baloney. So then that's where you get the idea of reincarnation and all the other pagan te teachings. 99%, if not 100% of all uh, false teachings that you hear about will be sourced out of Nimrod Semiramis. 99%, if not 100% of all major, major false teachings. Okay. So because of this, that's the reason why God can't concentrate on all those nations anymore. It's been corrupted through this paganism. So God's like, okay, I'm going to pick somebody. All right, who's he going to pick? Well, remember, you have to go back to the beginning. You got Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And then God's like, well, uh, the person that I'm going to use is Shem. Why is he the best prospect? Because if you recall Genesis 9, blessed be the Lord God of Shem. So because of that, the Lord says, well, because my blessing fell upon Shem's line, I'm going to choose his seed, because it's through Shem's lineage where uh, they take spirituality, they take spirituality more seriously, or they take me more seriously. And I've given some cases of that even with the Native Americans. They talk about the all great spirit, encompassing spirit. Of course, a lot of that is baloney and the devil uses it, but it shows you where their mindset is. They have a mindset more on God. That's the idea. Now, if we return <clears throat> to Genesis chapter 11 and verse 10, now let's uh, focus our attention on Abram's generations now, how the Holy Spirit moves. So then he starts out with Shem. That's how the Holy Spirit moves. Okay, I'm going to start out with Shem. These are the generations of Shem. Shem was 100 years old and begat our facts at two years after the flood. So notice right here, uh, it's self-explanatory. Generations of Shem explained. These are they, starting with Shem himself. He was 100 years old when, uh, through his lineage, Arphaxed was born. And Arphaxed, when was he born? Two years after the flood. So once the flood was over, then Shem started to, uh, give, uh, he started to give lineage to children. Verse 11, and Shem lived after he begat Arphaxad 500 years. So once Arphaxad was born, Shem lived 500 years afterwards and begat sons and daughters. So he was able to have more children, sons and daughters after that. And Arphaxad lived five and, uh, lived five and 30 years and begat Selah. All right, this is a very important passage. We're going uh, to cover two arguments over here. Our facts said live five and thirty years. So in other words, notice this drop, this huge drop. If you look at verse 10, Shem, when he was a hundred, then he started to have children born. But our facts said 35 years, then he started to have children born. That's kind of similar to our timeline. All right, to our time range when uh, we would have children born. I'm not sure if that would be in my case around that age. But anyway, sounds like a good age. But anyway, uh, point is, is that uh, we see that Selah was born when our fact said was 30 and 5 years. Why is there a big, huge drop? Why is there a big, huge change? Because you'll notice if you keep reading on the rest of the passage, people were dying much younger. They were dying much younger. If you recall Genesis 5, they, almost, they lived about 900 years, these people. So why is it that it started to drop all of a sudden? It's like what I told you before. Due to the flood, there were environmental changes. So it's very important to consider that. Because of the flood, there were environmental changes. So then people's uh, uh, years of living longer was much shorter. It was much shorter. Okay, this don't match this one. I don't know why. <clears throat> but they were living shorter years, these people. So then, the atmosphere caused a detriment to their health. It affected their health in a way 
where they weren't able to live longer. So if we believe that the atmosphere went through changes, then this is scientific proof here. Notice how your Bible is automatically scientific with, the verse, with this simple verse. Our facts said live five and thirty years and be at Salem. What is so scientific about that? You're more scientific than a lot of these evolutionists. Evolutionists, one of their most trustworthy dating sources to prove evolution, supposedly, is carbon-14 dating method. Now, carbon-14 dating method, what that does is they go by the assumption that depending on the atmosphere, that's how they can measure, and then because the body receives a certain amount of carbon itself, then if you go through a decayed fossil and then there's some carbon that you can measure and date. But all of that measurement with the carbon and the atmosphere producing and etc., all of that comes from the atmosphere rate itself. In other words, the atmosphere should be constant and it should not change. If the atmosphere at its pace and its rate and where it's going, if it's consistent and constant, then carbon-14 dating works. But the Bible already showed you, no, that's not how it works. So notice that the Bible disproved two evolution pointers here. It disproved two evolution arguments. One is carbon-14 dating method. Atmosphere always changes. Secondly, you also notice that, uh, that you cannot get like fossils that can go out for like thousands of years or something like that. They'll try to say mankind's civilization went on for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years. But you'll notice right here that the timeline is much short, much more short. Another thing that we want to cover is a contradiction supposedly in your King James Bible. You'll notice that our facts that he begat Selah. All right, so if that's the case, when we're going by the passage, and we believe the King James Bible is perfect, amen. It doesn't have any errors whatsoever, amen. But this seems to point out that there's an error. The error right here is that our facts add, and then after our facts add, then it's Selah. But then actually it's skipping somebody here. So then it's a person named Canaan. Now go to Luke chapter 3, Luke chapter 3. In the New Testament, the Bible points out that after our facts said, Canaan was born. And then when Canaan was born, then it was Selah. So then Genesis has a contradiction. Hence, you got some modern Bibles. And then even the great LXX. What is the LXX? I don't know what that is. LXX, what that is, is supposedly there were Jews who wrote a Greek Old Testament before Jesus Christ was born, which is, a bun which is fairy tale. It's total fairy tale. You know what this LXX is? It's origins creation. That's what it is. It's not a real thing. It's a fake thing. So uh, understanding that the LXX is a figment of your imagination. It's a fairy tale. LXX is just as scientifically reliable as evolution. That's how much of a fairy tale it is. So the LXX, realizing it's just as scientifically as accurate as evolution, uh, atheists might take that as a compliment, but uh, I hope you Christians take that as great as a big joke. Okay. So because it's just as scientifically as accurate as evolution, haha, -ha, then we can see right here that this must be bogus, that this has to be a lie. And I'm going to prove to you why this is a lie. They thought that they were helping God out by inserting Canaan. But actually, the LXX was its own doom. And I'll show you why that the LXX, by doing that, it just proved itself that, hey, I'm actually a creation from origin or from somebody else years later. I'm not written in the Old Testament. So, look at Luke chapter 3. Notice how the Bible goes back with verse 35. 
which was, it's going backwards all the way to Adam, all right? So then if we're going to go backwards, then we got to go this way. Selah, Canaan, Arphaxad, okay? So look at right here. 35, which was the son of Saruk, which was the son of Rago, which was the son of Phalek, which was the son of Eber, which was the son of Selah, which was the son of, well, it's Canaan, see that? Canaan, which was the son of Arphaxad, which was the son of Sam, so that's Shem, which was the son of Noah, that's Noah. So notice right here, there's a contradiction in your King James Bible. No, uh, we'll, we're going to disprove the LXX first, okay? So let's go to 1 Chronicles 1, 1 Chronicles 1. You know how we know that the LXX, that it was just simply copycatting afterwards from sources that were New Testament era? Not Old Testament. LXX is not a Greek Old Testament. We know that it was copycatting from writings during the New Testament era. You might say, why is that? Because 1 Chronicles chapter 1 did not even mention Canaan's name either. So the Hebrew Old Testament doesn't mention Canaan. Then you have to ask yourself, where did the LXX then get the idea Canaan from, if not from Luke? And Luke is New Testament. So this is a very powerful argument against the LXX. This is evidence that the LXX, it was conjured up. That they took biblical writings after the Old Testament was done. And then after even the New Testament was done. And then they took those writings and then they made up their own book. Just like the book of Enoch. That might offend some of you, especially onlineers. But that, you take these as biblical authorities, but you have very little lack of knowledge of biblical history and manuscript evidence. If you study those things, false books of the Bible were so prevalent during those times. It was absolutely prevalent. It was such a major catastrophe that time. People were pretending to be apostles and pretending to write books of the Bible that were from the early B.C.s. All right, let's go to 1 Chronicles chapter 1. Now let's look at Shem's lineage here. Verse 17, the sons of Shem, Elam and Asher and Arphaxad, right? And Lud and Aram and Uz and Hul and Gether and Meshach. Verse 18, and Arphaxad begat what? Shelah and Shelah begat Eber. See that? So that's another uh, wording for Selah. Now, some of you might wonder why is the uh, wording a little bit different. The reason why is because sometimes... Uh, it's like even today, sometimes people, when they pronounce your names or then uh, they hear your name, sometimes they'll write it differently depending on how you pronounce it. Because during that timeline, a lot of people, they went by oral tradition or how they heard it. That's the reason why English, you got to realize English language, the way you're talking right now, was not like that for 6,000 years. It went through many changes and you'll see it spelled differently, worded differently. Look at 1611 King James. It's spelled and worded differently compared to how you would do it with today's King James Bible. You might say, why is that people's pronunciation that time? So it's, it's just simple pronunciation. It's linguistics. Let's go back. So understanding that this is a creation of the LXX, and how do we explain this contradiction? I want you to uh, go to Genesis, go back to Genesis, but also I want you to turn to John, go to book of John 8. John chapter 8. There are two simple reasons. One, God can skip a generation if he wants to. It's that simple. You might say, does God do that? Sure he does. As a matter of fact, if you look at the book of uh, Matthew or Luke, when it talks about the generations, it's in a bridged form. It doesn't tell you all the names. You're going to see some names skipped. So that's common. God sometimes skips names. Why would he skip Canaan? Maybe because this is a timeline of Genesis, God takes Canaan very seriously. Remember God, when he put the curse on Ham, he mentioned specifically which name? Canaan. Remember wh who came out? The, the Nephilim, the, uh, the sons of uh, God through the giants. Canaan, right? God took Canaan so seriously that he wanted them to be wiped out and the Jews to take over that land and territory. 
So maybe during the timeline of Genesis, when this is all being written out, God took it seriously that it's like, I just want to skip that name. And if you recall back at Genesis 5, remember Genesis 5? There were people who uh, named their children because they idolized Cain's lineage or the bad people's names. It's like, uh, who would name their child Judas? No one would dare do that. But if you love uh, Satan so much, or if you uh, find a hero within some demonic people, you think that it's an honor to give them that name. Right? That's just been common. That's just been common. You see these pagan rappers and pagan singers today, and parents want to name their children after their names. That's just common. So maybe, so that could be one explanation. Second explanation, which is uh, more simplistic, is when God mentions about, when we read here verse 13, and our facts had lived after he begat Selah 403 years and begat sons and daughters, and Selah lived 30 years and begat Eber. It's important to understand when the Bible talks about when Selah was born from our facts had's line, that there was, for some of you who didn't know, there were families marrying into each other. Now, we're going to see that with Abram's case. That was very, very common. You might say, why was that common? Well, because of Genesis 5, remember? Cain and Abel. We already covered that incest issue, so I'm not going to do it again here, all right? So it was common that time that because, you know, you have to repopulate through Noah and three sons and their wives. How are you going to do that unless you marry into the family? So it was common that time. So because it was common that time, uh, and it was also common that time, that there were uh, different wives. So one man would have different wives. Polygamy. Why was there polygamy? We covered that in Genesis 5, remember? So at Genesis 5, there, were, there was polygamy going on. So understanding that, then we can see over here that when we cover Genesis uh, chapter 11 and verse 13, when Selah was born through Arphaxad's lineage, that it could be referring to that it's somehow where Canaan and Selah there was somehow this confusion, I don't know how it works, but somehow confusion where there were people marrying into the family. And that's why you can be sometimes uh, the sister of somebody, but at the same time the wife of somebody. The brother of somebody or the husband of somebody. So remember that was common that time. So I don't know how that would work. But a second thing is this. The second thing is God would consider uh, Selah as the son, but not how you would see it. When we would say that the Jews are birthed from the lineage of Abraham, for example, that doesn't mean that today's modern Jews, that immediately they're born from Abraham. It just means they come, they, were, they come from the birth line. They, were, uh, they come from his flesh, but Abraham would be their great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather, and they would be great-great-great-great-grandson. Yet Jews call him their father. That doesn't mean Abraham is a uh, like immediate father of today's modern Jew. But if a modern Jew said that Abraham is my father, then what do they mean by that? Great, 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 great grandfather. As a matter of fact, if you look up in your Bible, the Bible's wording of this is not uh, grandfather or grandson. The Bible would uh, the Bible doesn't put that grand in there. The only time it does that is only one passage. Didn't you know that? So the Bible's wording is different from your wording. There's only one place that's grandmother in New Testament. And remember, that was originally written, written in Greek. So then how they translate it to grandmother would be originally from Greek and then perhaps to uh, maybe Syriac or Latin and then went down to English. So it goes through translation process, but also the biblical wording how God would do it. But Old Testament, God never did that. In the Old Testament, how God worded it, here's an example, a great example, is verse 31. In Genesis eleven thirty-one. 31. And Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran, his what? Son, son. 
So that would be basically grandson, but it says son, son. Why would the Bible word it that way? The reason why the Bible words it that way uh, is because that's just how he chose a wording. God can choose whatever wording he wants. So notice that grandson is not mentioned. So we have to understand that kind of language. So then it would be accurate. Selah, which is true, is the grandson uh, from our Faxad or somehow born from that lineage of our Faxad's line. That's the pointer. That's the point. If we look at uh, John 8, if we look at John 8. John chapter 8, here's an, we see this example. What did Jesus say at verse 56? To the modern day Jews, right? Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. See that? That doesn't mean that Abraham is their immediate father. Look at verse 53. This is the modern, uh, this is the Jews during Jesus' time. Art thou greater than our father Abraham? That doesn't mean that Abraham is their immediate father. Here's another example. Another example that Jesus points out is verse, let's see here, 39, 39. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, if ye were Abraham's what? Children. Children. See? So they were birthed uh, from Abraham's lineage, family line. But that doesn't mean that they were directly born from him or Abraham immediately uh, with his family gave birth to them. Let's go back here. Let's go back. I think that's an important, important uh, pointer too. It says begat, right? So then it means to give birth. So if we take it at that sense, obviously males cannot uh, give birth to children. It's the woman. So we have to understand God's biblical language when he uses the word begat. A lot of times it doesn't mean our sense of biological immediate offspring of coming out. That's not what it means. Begat God, sometimes God's way of thinking things is different. He's thinking things of basically you're just born from their lineage. We have to understand that. Okay, let's go back to Genesis chapter 10. Genesis chapter 10. So... The evidence with that is obviously our facts had begat uh, Selah, which we know that's not what begat means then. So begat has to have a different meaning because there's no way a male can give birth to a different male. So begat has to, you has to be understood in the proper context. All right, now that uh, we solved the so-called contradiction, let's look at verse 13. And our facts had lived after he begat Selah 400 and three years, and begat sons and daughters. That's self-explanatory. After uh, Selah was born, Arphaxed had lived afterwards 403 years, and then he also had other children born. Verse 14, and Selah lived 30 years and begat Eber. So notice that when he was 30 years old, Selah had Eber born. Verse 15, and Selah lived after he begat Eber 403 years and begat sons and daughters. So that's self-explanatory, Selah. Uh, when he, he had Eber born, lived afterwards 403 years, and then had other sons and daughters born. Verse 16, and Eber lived four and 30 years and begat Peleg. So then Eber, uh, 30 and four years, then he had Peleg born. And he, Eber lived after he begat Peleg 430 years and begat sons and daughters. That's self-explanatory. Eber, after he had Peleg born, 430 years he lived, had other th sons and daughters born. And Peleg lived 30 years and begat Ryu. Okay, that's where we left off. In verse 10 through 17, that matched with uh, Genesis 10 about Shem's lineage, right? But did you notice in Shem's lineage how God did it at Genesis 10? At Genesis 10, how he ended Shem's lineage, when we go back there at Genesis chapter 10, and verse 25, verse 25, God was focusing where he had, let's see, Terah all the way somewhere from Eber. Where from Eber, we had two people, Peleg and Joktan. Now, remember, who's the more important person? It's Peleg, right? But Peleg's a more important person but in Genesis 10, God didn't concentrate on Peleg's uh, children. 
Who did he concentrate on? Jock 10 at verse 26 and onward. Why did God do that? Because that was the only mention of where uh, the Asians would come from, where I taught you before, the Asian lineage. It's from Joktan. So that's why God may mention, because he wanted to point out, because Asia is, uh, the Asians, there's no doubt about it, they have a significant play in history ever since the BCs and even in the tribulation to the future events and even current events today. So then this group of people is important for understanding the nation spreading out. That's why God mentioned them through Joktan. But they're not that important to God compared to Peleg. So then what did God mention Peleg? He mentioned him at Genesis 11. Why would he continue on with Peleg? The reason why he... Here's the thing that's going to be pretty eye-opening. I think that if Abraham or Abram during that time, I'll explain why, the name difference, but during that time, uh, Peleg, if Abram and the Jews did not come out from there, Jock 10 would be the, the more focal point. Because why? Genesis 10, God concentrated on Jock 10's lineage. It's as if he was concentrating on him, but then there was a transition and change to Peleg. Why? Because Peleg, they were going to be in a territory. Uh, their descendants were in a territory that's uh, going to be his land, what God wanted. The nation of Israel. Whereas Joktan was going way out east over there. <clears throat> so now we're covering the important part where Genesis 10 did not cover. So this is where you want to know. This is where Genesis 10 did not cover. It ended with Peleg giving birth, uh, it, gave, uh, it ended off with Peleg, right? And we don't know what happened after that, him and Joktan's lineage. So now let's see what happened afterward. Verse 18, and Peleg lived 30 years and begat Ryu. So Ryu was born when Peleg was 30 years old. Verse 19, and Peleg lived after he begat Ryu 209 years. So uh, Ryu, after he was born, Peleg lived afterwards about 209 years and begat sons and daughters. So he gave birth to other children. Now, uh, some of you might find it tiring when I try to explain uh, every word uh, from the verse. You might go, I know what it means, move on. But the reason why I'm doing it is because, no, you don't really know. That's why I can't move on. Uh, the re originally, people, when they read their Bible, they're like, well, the words are too hard. But then when we come to the generation line, you're like, no, I already know, move on. That's the reason why I have to explain every word to you. Because originally you said the words are so hard to understand. Why did you say all of a sudden now, oh, I get it, move on. Mm -hmm. You know why? It's not that hard to understand after all. all right, brother. Come on. You just don't take time to study every word and to explain every word. Yeah. I'm doing that work for you. And that's why it's coming in easy for you. That's the reason why I'm doing verse-by-verse -verse Bible studies. I want you to see that it is truly easy un to understand every word in that verse. Amen, bro. But in order for you to do that, the reason why you can't do that is because you're still a baby level. Babies can't read either, right? Mm. That's common sense in life. So that's why baby Christians, it's hard for them, so it takes, they have to put effort like babies do. You have to put effort to read. Say A, B, C. That's why I'm teaching you all of that and explaining to you. And for you to say, to act like a baby and say, no, 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 I'm a big boy. Move on. I'm a big boy. I get that part, pastor. Give me the deeper doctrine. No, I can't move on, you baby. Amen, Until you understand every word in that book, then it'll be easier to digest the other stuff. All right, I just had to say that, all right? Because I, I'm, I have a feeling 50% of you, when I explain the verses, those thoughts just came into mind. Okay, all right. Move on, right? Let's move on. Okay. We left off now at verse uh, 20. And Ryu lived two and thirty years and begat Sirug. So Sirug was born when Ryu was 32 years old. And Ryu lived after he begat Sirug 207 years and begat sons and daughters. So Ryu, after he had Sirug born, uh, he lived 207 years. And then he also had sons and daughters born. Verse 22, and Sirug lived 30 years and begat Nahor. So notice that after living for 30 years, uh, he had Nahor born, uh, born. Now, it's very interesting that it's during their 30s that they were giving birth, to, uh, that they had children born. So it's probably following, uh, what they were doing is that they were following what their previous generations were doing. 
oh, it's normal to have uh, children at this age, which is the same thing like today, right? Some of you get worried about getting married, you know, because you're getting there up in years or having children because you're getting there up in years and you're like, what's a good time? What's a good time? The reason why you get concerned and you get worried is because you look at your previous generations or people around you at what age they're getting married, at what age they're having children, right? So then because of that, that's the reason why uh, it's just common. It's just common that people were giving uh, birth to children or having children born during uh, that age. Look at verse 23. And Sirig lived after he begat Nahor 200 years and begat sons and daughters. Notice right here that uh, after Nahor was born, he lived 200 years and then he had other children born. We look at verse 24, and Nahor lived nine and 20 years and begat Terah. So Nahor, he was 29 years old when he had Terah born. And Nahor lived after he begat Terah 119 years and begat sons and daughters. So after Terah was born, Nahor lived about 119 years and had other sons and daughters born. And Terah lived 70 years and begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Okay, if you notice right here, notice that Terah named one of his children after the name of his father. So that's just common. That's very common that people, they would name their children after uh, the name of their previous ancestry, right? Sometimes that happens. Let's see over here. So verse 26, Terah lived 70 years. And then had Abram, Nahor, Haran born. Now we come to the important point here. I drew all this for a reason because I'm going, it's going to get a little confusing. So that way you can follow along. So Terah comes from right here, Eber, all right, and from Peleg. And then he had three of these children born. Now notice that Abram is introduced. Abram when he is introduced, notice it's not Abraham as you would know commonly. His name originally was Abram. Now, you might say, why is that? You're going to find out later on God changed his name. So you're going to find that out later. Abram, there's a lot, you can do preaching on that one, but I won't do it in this lesson. I'll do it later. But Abram is one of the greatest types of a New Testament Christian. You can dig up so much wealth of Abram. There are so many cases. One, you see a case of salvation by faith without works involved. It was imputed righteousness, which is what Paul used. So Abram is a classic example of that. Abram, uh, he's a classic example of a person who went out by faith. And then uh, he's a sojourner, stranger, pilgrim. Christians are known as sojourners, pilgrims. We're not uh, comfortable in this world. Uh, we follow faith. Faith, we walk by faith, not by sight, like, Ab uh, like Abraham d uh, did back then. Now, why was, he, uh, named, uh, why was he named Abraham later on will be explained later, but his name Abram was his original name. What it meant was, this is pretty funny, it meant high father. Now, we know that Abraham is the uh, father of uh, many nations, and God gave that name to him, but Abram meant high father. Now, why did God change his name? Because his old name, sometimes uh, names can be very telling about people. Sometimes it can be the case. Abram's case, when he's high father, notice that sense of pride in there, which explains why at verse 30, his wife and him had no children. He had no children. Why? God had to teach him something. You're not all that. So Abram had a pride issue. So God had to teach him humility and teach him something. All right, returning back to the main text, verse 26, we explain three children born, Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Now, uh, verse 27, now these are the generations of Terah. So now we're covering Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran begat Lot. So notice right here that Terah's generation are now explained. He gave birth, uh, he had Abram, Nahor, and Haran born. And then Haran begat Lot. So God mentioned that part. Lot, that means is important. 
he came from uh, Haran's line. He was birthed from Haran. So notice that right here. These are the children of Haran. Okay, Milka, Iska, uh, and Lot. They come from Haran. Now notice what happens right over here. Verse 28, and Haran died before his father Terah. So Haran died earlier than Terah, his father. So Haran passed away. So Haran passed away, and then here's his uh, daughter and his son uh, living, uh, still living. In the land of his nativity in Ur of the Chaldees. Okay, so his native land, where he comes from, so where Haran comes from, Terah comes from, Abram comes from, is the Ur of the Chaldees. Ur of the Chaldees is very, very important place. It's a close terrain to where Nimrod was, where Nimrod, he had his own New World Order going. Ur of the Chaldees also was a very uh, prosperous, uh, prosperous, powerful place, civilization. But God had him move out of that. Why? Because of all the paganism being influenced by Nimrod. So you can see right here how God was trying to, uh, while, while Satan was building up something, God had to separate something and start something else to compete against the devil's civilization and system. He was going to use Abram. Now, Ur of the Chalde uh, Chaldees, where it is mentioned from Dr. Ruckman, he'd say, he'd say, uh, he wrote over here in his generous, uh, Genesis commentary, the modern Mugair or um, Mugayar, if I'm pronouncing that right, was once a seaport on the Persian Gulf at the mouth of the Euphrates River. So you can uh, notice that over here uh, within uh, this map. I'll move it out of the way. As I read this, you can look at the map. It was once a seaport on the Persian Gulf at the mouth of the Euphrates River, 12 miles from the traditional site of the Garden of Eden. It is located within 50 miles of the modern Basra of Iraq. So that's what Dr. Upman claimed, where the Ur of the uh, Chaldees is located. So being uh, close to the Garden of Eden, then that fresh soil, fresh civilization, it's a wonder why uh, Ur of the Chaldees chose that place. It, in fact, uh, what's interesting, let's see right here. Did, it, did the Bible say this? Let's see, verse 10. Yeah, if you look at Genesis 13, 10, it's very interesting that there was a prosperous cities being built was being compared to the Garden of Eden. Genesis 13, 10. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the Garden of the Lord like the land of Egypt as thou comest unto Zohar. So notice how the uh, Garden of Eden is used as the epitome example of people wanting to build their civilizations. All right, let's go back. Everybody wants to go back to the garden or be kind of similar to the Garden of Eden. But Abram left that and he went by faith to a desolate terrain where God would uh, build his nation, his civilization. Genesis chapter 11 Verse 29, and Abram and Nahor took them wives. Okay, so Abram and Nahor are going to get married. They're going to have wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. All right, so let's break this down, right? See, you didn't really get it, so we have to break this down. That's why it's important to explain every word. So we already got the first part of verse 29. I explained that. Uh, but the second part, the name of Abram's wife was Sarai. So Abram was married to a woman named Sarai. Now I drew this line here for a reason. You're going to find out, okay? And the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah. Okay, so Nahor had a wife named Milcah. But why is this line connected to here? So let's keep reading. The daughter of Haran. So notice that he's uh, that Milka 
is the daughter of Haran, right here, or Haran, however way you want to pronounce that. But as we keep reading onward, the father of Milcah. Okay, why did it read it that way? So basically, it's trying to explain. Sometimes when you explain things further, it can be a little bit more confusing, right? It could have just ended there. But uh, the Bible did that to explain further. So the father of Milcah, why did it put, mention that part? Because of uh, Haran over here before. Haran, comma, the father of Milcah. See that in your text? So that's why it read it that way. So basically, the Bible's trying to make it clear. So Milcah's the daughter, so it's like this. Milcah's the daughter of Haran, okay? Haran, the father of Milcah. See that? It's trying to explain it that way. Let's keep reading. And the father of Iska. Oh, great. It just made it more clear, I guess, or more confusing. Iska is also another child born from Haran. Now, I'm assuming that because of the similar uh, syllables over here, that they must be women, that they must be women. All right? This is the same thing like Korean. Sometimes they'll mention that the first syllable with uh, brothers would be similar or the last syllables would be similar with brothers or with uh, uh, sisters. Sometimes they do that. So my brother is the same thing. It has a similar ending like mine, and I'm not going to tell you. Okay. So uh, we see here at verse 29, that's how it works. So then, wait a minute. They were marrying within the family then, within Terah's family. Abram's the same. Th so we see that when Haran, uh, when Haran died, that Nahor took his daughter and then married her. Why is that? It may be because it was common in the Old Testament that if somebody in the family died, that you want to continue on their offspring or you want to continue their generations, right? Like uh, the Pharisees tried to tempt Jesus with that one. Like somebody died, but then the brother took this woman. So then the woman married this brother. And then when that bro brother died, married that other brother. So basically seven brothers in total. So then... Uh, uh, whose wife is she? So that, that, that was obviously a lie, okay? That was much as a fairy tale as evolution and LXX we covered from the Pharisees. Pharisees were high scholars too. What's the lesson learned? I just love to kick scholars, so I have to park it here. Pharisees were no different from today's modern scholars. What, what are they? They always teach you fairy tale lies. They always make up crazy stuff. They act so smart and pompous and prideful and these guys are just idiots at its finest. That they'll say something stupid like, that your great ancestor came from a monkey, or that the LXX is real, or that, uh, yeah, she married into seven brothers. That's how crazy and stupid you get. All right, so anyways, when we continue on over here, so then they were all, inter uh, so it's possible the reason why he married her is because to carry on the lineage and to carry on the family. Or uh, it could be, which, uh, which might be a horrible thing, is that the, the lamest thing that might happen is that without his permission, because he passed away, was <laughs> married his daughter after that. That would be the lamest thing to do. <laughs> Imagine what Heron would feel after that. No, you don't have my permission. <laughs> Now, remember, this was common that time. This was common that time. I'm not going to go through a defensive manner uh, why uh, this, was normal. this was normal or that was okay back then. All right? I explained that a long time ago at my Genesis 5 study. I'm not going to do it in this one. Let's continue onward. So we know that uh, Sarai, uh, why is she included with this family uh, intermingling? You notice that, right? So because it'd be, it's... The Bible says here at Genesis 11, verse 29, Abram and Naor took them wives. So that would be, uh, it gave you a hint here. Naor, if he married someone into the family, and it says Abram and Nahor, they took them wives, it seems to show that they were in unison in something together here. So they were doing something similarly. So if Nahor married into the family, Abram would do the same thing too. And this is given at the book of Genesis. Go to Genesis chapter 20. Let's see right here. Genesis chapter 20. Go to Genesis chapter 20. And notice what Abram's, uh, Abraham, 
he, his name was changed that time. Notice what Abraham said to the Philistines. Look at uh, Genesis chapter 20, verse uh, 12. What did Abraham say about his wife, Sarah, who was changed that time? Verse 12. Genesis 20, verse 12. And yet, indeed, she is my sister. Why is indeed uh, she her, his sister? She is the daughter of my father. See, Terah. But not the daughter of my mother. See, so Terah had a different wife. So polygamy. And she became my wife. So that's what happened. All right, going back. Go to Genesis chapter 11. All right, we have some time to cover for you women. This is going to be interesting. Verse 30, but Sarai was barren. She had no child. So notice right here that uh, 29, seems like Nahor had a better case right here. So he was able to produce offspring and children. Sarai, unfortunately, didn't have that. So Sarai had no child because Abram noticed his name meant high father. means high father. So... Uh, she had no children. What can we learn about Sarai here? Very interesting things. Sarai, for some of you who don't know, her name was changed to Sarah, which uh, I'll explain why la later. It means princess. But originally her name meant a different one. It was Sarai, which means, believe it or not, contentious one. So this was a woman that you would think, oh, she was one of, yeah, she was one of those. <laughs> she's, she's the typical aspiration of what modern day women want to be because she was actually extremely beautiful too. Even at her old age, she was extremely beautiful. There were kings and rulers who wanted her that Abraham even suspected that, that he had to lie and cover. She's my sister. So why would he do that? The reason why is because she's very beautiful. So this is the type of woman that every woman wants to be today. You can see that there. But, what, but the Lord had different plans for her. Look at 1 Peter 3. Now, this is what you women want to hear, all right? Now, I'm, I'm not a woman, thank God, so I can't predict and tell you what you women are thinking or what you want, but I'm assuming, all right, we just go by the assumption, women today, they want to look very beautiful, that's why they do that makeup, they do the dressing, that's why they look pretty. They have, what they want to be is have aspirations of being an independent woman while being beautiful. That's the aspirations of modern day women today. But there is something that you want to know about uh, Sarai or Sarah that time. If there's somebody you want to be, it's not Sarai, you want to be Sarah. That's who you want to be. So how you become a Sarah is as follows. This is what Sarah did, all right? You can either be a Sarai or you can be a Sarah. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3. Look at verse 6. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him what? Lord, that's huge. Can I get a raise of hands and an amen from one of the women who called their husband, you're my Lord? I don't see that anyway. I don't think any woman did that before, you know. You husbands, put your, okay, you husbands, you're high father. Watch out for that. Put your hands down, you husbands, all right? <laughs> Got the high mentality, all right? So, all right. Now, let me get back to preaching at the woman. Don't let, make me go back to you men, all right? <laughs> it was pretty funny, some of you guys doing that. All right, then. But anyway. Now, going back to the main point over here, uh, I mean, you, do I ha see a raise of hands of women doing that? Of course not. Why? You're so ingrained and used to the culture of this time. See? Now, I'm not saying that you have to go call him Lord, but I'm pointing out a good example of Sarah's case that she obeyed him so much that she recognized who her master was. Now, if you, don't, uh, if you have different emotions and feelings of that one, then uh, you don't understand verse 6. That's how the Bible should do it. If you look at verse 5, For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands. Keep following along the context here. 
Verse 3, whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plating of the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Two things to notice over here that Sarah changed. She was no longer contentious. She submitted to her husband. Second thing, her beauty, she was a very beautiful woman. But notice the context of 1 Peter 3. She wasn't thinking about vainglory in her beauty. She didn't prize her beauty as much as before. That's totally opposite from today's women, is it not? And that's something that you women need to learn is from Sarah's case. I hope that you can learn something important there. Because there is so much important information that you're missing out. Didn't you know that Sarah or Sarai, during that time, is the first in a series of seven barren women in the Bible who did not give birth to children. But there are either types of Israel or the church. Amen. You know why you should be something what Sarah does? You women picture all of us. You picture Bible believers today. You're supposed to symbolize... For the women here, San Jose Bible Baptist Church. Wow. But if we get women who typify and represent a typical example of women in the Bay Area, do you want to picture and symbolize San Francisco? You want to picture and symbolize San Jose? Not with the liberal communities here. That'd be a poor picture example. Why don't you picture what a real Bible believer is? This will preach. This will preach right here. Because you, uh, the cases of women, you women are so special. I've given teachings on women, several teachings on women. You women have a very important role that you don't realize. You picture church. You picture the church. It's so interesting that Dr. Uckman writes here, they all point to or prefigure the need for a miraculous birth of some kind. All seven women have sons who are types of Christ, and whether the miraculous birth is the virgin birth of Christ, the birth of the nation of Israel in the tribulation, or the new birth of the believer in the church age, the women are clearly presented. Here are seven cases, and uh, you want to write them down, which will be very eye-opening and helpful. All right, we're not going to turn to these verses, but I would like you to write down these seven women. One is obviously Sarah. Why? Her son is the greatest type of Christ in the Bible, Isaac. Why? Because Isaac was that lamb in the sacrifice that the father gave up his only begotten son. Sarah had that privilege and honor. Second is Rebecca. Rebecca. So she had trouble giving birth to a child too, actually. So then she had to pray to the Lord about it. So the Lord finally helped her give birth to children. But uh, it's after 20 years of prayers, 20 years of praying that she finally was able to give birth to Jacob. What does Jacob mean? Israel. Israel. But your Bible is called uh, King James Bible. For some of you who didn't know, that's actually from King Jacob. How about that, right? Three, Rachel. Rachel. She was also unable to give birth to children, especially when her sister was giving birth to children. That made her mad. If there's something that uh, makes a woman angry is that when she has competition with a different female, that she sees as public enemy number one. But she finally gives birth to Joseph. Joseph is what? The greatest type of Christ in the Bible too. Uh, Arthur W. Pink wrote a book in Gleanings in Genesis and he claimed to have found over 100, maybe 200 ways how Joseph can picture Jesus Christ. That's how much he stretched it. So I don't go that far, but there is, a po uh, there is a point here is that basically Joseph has too many things similar to Jesus Christ. Joseph sold for uh, tw uh, 30, was it 20? Yeah, 20 pieces of silver. Jesus, 30 pieces of silver sold. Uh, Joseph, uh, he became the ruler, uh, second in charge ruler, Jesus Christ, second in charge ruler next to the Father as well. Uh, Joseph humbled as a servant or slave 
and then became exalted. Jesus as a servant in Philippians and then became exalted as king. All right, number four, Hannah. Hannah, she also couldn't give birth to child. So because she couldn't give birth to a child, she had to pray to the Lord. But she gave birth to Samuel. Who, Samuel was what? He was, a, uh, he was a type of priest and prophet. You know that? He was a priest following, uh, uh, filling up for uh, uh, Hophni and Phinehas' shoes and then helping out the priesthood, but he was also a prophet too. You know who else was a priest and a prophet? So Moses didn't even have that privilege. But there's one, Jesus Christ, who was prophet and priest. Uh, let's see, Manoah's wife, Manoah's wife. She also had trouble giving birth to children. But then God says that, I'm going to bless you with a deliverer for Israel. And his name was Samson. His name was Samson. And then we know that the Messiah, or a messianic figure, deliver for Israel. Jesus Christ. Uh, number six is the Shunammite. Number six is the Shunammite. The Shunammite woman, she had no child. So then Elisha said that You'll, you're going to give birth to a child. So then a miracle happened where she was able to give birth to a child. But guess what about this child? The Shunammite's child, when it was born, the child died and resurrected. Jesus Christ died and resurrected. Elizabeth, who was also old, up in years, but the Lord gave her a miraculous birth, and then she was able to give birth to John the Baptist. Why is that important? John the Baptist was a Nazarite. Jesus Christ, he followed similarly the Nazarite vows. He was known as a Nazarene as well. You know what Dr. Upman also says about these seven women? All seven of these women are also types of Mary. So Mary also similarly matched with all these seven women. About basically a miraculous birth, giving birth uh, to Jesus Christ or types of Christ. Uh, if there's a woman you want to be, it's that. Uh, what's, why do you want to hold on to what you want to hold on to, huh, of this world? You want those things of this world that pass away and fade rather than these privileges and honor that God gives at last. You know what these women had? They had a picture and a symbol that lasted for thousands of years. That millions, millions of safe saints throughout all dispensations have heard about. And not only that, they got the rest of eternity to still get that privileged status. There's something you women want to be. It's that one. All right, not this independence, beautiful, I want to be an independent, beautiful woman and something like that. If you want to picture the world, if you want to picture Vogue magazine, if you want to picture the, uh, the female professors in those liberal universities today, doctor so-and-so after like that, doctor, uh, doctor uh, Jill Biden, something like that, which is such a fake doctor name anyway. But... Uh, but anyway, besides all that, if you want that kind of privilege and status what the liberal world looks up to, you can picture that, or you can picture the church. The greatest thing ever that the Lord has ever done. One of the greatest things that the Lord ever did. All right. Father God, I pray that uh, today's teachings were a blessing to the hearers, and uh, I pray that uh, we'll continue to increase our knowledge of the Scripture and to Bible-believing truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.